The only two things in life that are guaranteed are death and taxes. And I didn't want to be a mortician. Hey, Ben, thank you so much for the interview today. First and foremost, can you introduce a little bit about yourself? Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Ben Callengart. I am a, a shareholder at a small tax-focused public accounting firm in Reno, Nevada. You know, I had a great time meeting you at the AICPA Leadership Academy last fall. I look forward to seeing you at you know, AICPA Engage here in, uh, in a couple of weeks. But yeah, I, I love public accounting and I love tax. That's pretty much all you need to know about me. I met Ben at the AICPA Leadership Academy. Uh, that is a program that AICPA selects less than 40 people across the country to be in this leadership program for five day program. And you learn a lot about leadership uh, from this program. If anyone interested in this program, contact me or contact Ben for this program, it's really good. I had a great conversation with Ben when we were at um, AICPA Leadership Academy, but I want to go deeper about your career path, how you end up with where you are right now, and also why did you choose the accounting as your major at the very beginning? Definitely. Uh, accounting was not my first uh, first choice in college at all. Um, you know, I was, I, I kind of took the long route through college. I, you know, I think it took about six years to graduate. I was an economics major because I thought that would be interesting. And then I switched to social work and, you know, kind of social justice type stuff. And then I dropped out. And actually, after asking my wife, my now wife's parents for their blessing to propose, uh, they, they said yes, with the condition that I had to go get a college degree at some point. And my uh, fiance at the time was a CPA and worked at her dad's CPA firm and so I thought I'd give accounting a try and learn how much more it is than just being counting or you know the kind of stereotypical and learn how much you can really help businesses you know when I realized that accounting will give me a, an exposure to such a wide variety of businesses I realized it was a really interesting major and would give me the tools to really you know get to interact with a lot of a lot of interesting industries and interesting people so kind of took the long way to get there but uh, that's how I ended up there and why I stayed with it. So did you enjoy accounting classes? That's a good question. It would depend on the class. I will say I, I, I was lucky enough to have a few really inspiring professors at you know University of Nevada, Reno, who I still remain friends with to this day. That being said, I have to say that the most interesting parts of accounting, I think, are, aren't taught in the classroom. Um, you know, there's some very interesting concepts and, you know, some fun problem sets. I definitely enjoyed the job a lot more than I enjoyed the classes. So do you have any internships before you graduate or you went straight full-time job after you graduate? Uh, kind of both. So uh, instead of an internship, I actually accepted a full-time position as a staff accountant in a public accounting firm about a year before I graduated from UNR. So it would have been an internship other than that I was working 40 hours a week. Yeah, I definitely dove in head first and I started at the firm I'm actually a partner at now with about a year left on, you know, in my undergraduate program and worked in it for that last year of school. So how did you know about this firm when you were in college? Did you go to the career fair or someone introduce you? You could say I was introduced to that's the firm my wife was working at and uh, that her dad had founded. I was kind of going to school for accounting so that I could come work at this firm. You know, definitely a little bit of a cart and horse situation where I'd only ever intended to work at this firm. I had actually gotten an interview or an opportunity to interview with KPMG from an audit professor at UNR. And I had a pretty extensive talk with the founding partner at this firm with, you know, should I consider this? And I know I've been doing this, you know, accounting degree so that I can come work at your firm, but this seems like it could be a really interesting opportunity. And he had a really frank conversation with me and he honestly encouraged me to go give the big four a shot. I think I would struggle with the kind of cog in a wheel type environment where, you know, you're working on so many things and not even necessarily seeing the end product, end product let alone feeling like you were impacting it, you know, after my conversations with my professors and I realized that, that small firm accounting was really what I was excited to do. And so I, uh, stuck it out at the firm I'm now. Like at that age, in college, it's too young to know what you really want like for your whole life or for your whole career. At that time, how do you decide that you want to go for tax instead of trying something else for audit? Like I have a couple of jokes uh, and then I'll get into it for real. My first joke is, you know, the only two things in life that are guaranteed are death and taxes and I didn't want to be a mortician. And so uh, I thought that, you know, tax was about as uh, safe a career path as you could find. And, you know, my other joke is 
I don't want my clients to be legally obligated to hire me. I want them to, you know, I want them to hire me because they want to, not because the SEC is making them. Honestly, it was the my my father-in-law, who's now my business partner. Uh, I I saw the lifestyle he had. I saw the relationship he had with his clients. You know, on the tax side, I think you really get to play a, a much more involved um, advisory role. You know, you, you really can help people run their business and guide them. Whereas, you know, on the audit side, you have independence rules and, you know, other things that can sometimes get in the way. And I just, I live in Reno, Nevada. There are, is it nearly the demand for audit here? There aren't nearly as many, you know, publicly traded companies. And so, you know, while there's still plenty of firms that do a lot of audit work, the clients that I really looked forward to working with were clients who, who hire a CPA for taxes and they, you know, maybe they need to review financial statement every now and again, which we'll do, uh, but they don't need audit. I was fortunate enough that I actually had the opportunity to work a full-time job that could support me through college pretty comfortably. And that was in the construction industry. I did uh, estimating for a really large architectural millwork firm Essentially, it's fancy. It's like really fancy woodworking. But I realized that I really like working with contractors and people in the construction industry and that just a little more kind of blue collar type environment. And that most of the construction companies, you know, any of the construction companies that would work with a local CPA in you know, Reno don't need audits. And so they're not looking for an auditor. They're looking for someone to help them kind of tax plan and you know, strategize you know, on the business side. And so I just knew tax was going to get me into the rooms that would let me have the conversations that I really look forward to having. So you mentioned that you work at another company before you work in public and you work at that job during the time you were in college. So now I'm wondering what skills that you learned from that job during the time you were in college that you could use after you graduate in accounting. I, th I think that could take up the rest of our conversation uh, here today. It's I keep talking about kind of the advisory role that I like to you know, occupy in accounting. And so, you know, specifically for my, you know, construction clients, I've had construction clients ask me, hey, can you evaluate my estimating template? And let me know what I'm overlooking. And so, you know, I'm not just, you know, tracing through the Excel formulas, you know, like someone who maybe had just gone to college and didn't have experience. I'm also looking at it and saying, hey, you know, yeah, you have eight hours of work in for each day, but aren't you guys going to have to, you know, drive to the job site and pay for parking? And, you know, so maybe you should do a factor of 1.1 or 1.15, you know, for every man hour. And, you know, kind of those those specific things, because, you know, I, I would bid a job and we'd lose money and I'd have to go figure out how. And so, you know, it, it can be as, you know, as granular as that, where it's, you know, specifically, I built estimating templates, I can help you review yours, or it can just be, you know, the ability to speak contractor. It's, you know, it, it's kind of a, a phrase I use where, you know, uh, every industry has a different colloquialisms and manners of speaking and just manners of conveying information. For example, we have a lot of medical clients. Our doctors don't want an answer from us until it is 100% correct. You know, they want it, research it all the way through three times backwards and forwards. Whereas if a contractor calls you with a question, he doesn't want to hear you hem and haw or go back and forth or, you know, you know they'll say, quit wringing your hands. Tell them to the best you know. And if you were wrong, tell them you were wrong. And so I think just the... The comfort interacting with people in that industry, as well as that industry-specific knowledge, put me in a really good place to serve that industry. And so, um, for that reason, I'd say about 70% of my clients are contractors. Wow, so do you have another construction license besides a CPA license? I, I don't know, and it's funny. I've, I've considered looking into it. Up until now, it was, you know, kind of getting the CPA license, you know, before I was focusing on other things. CIFP is what I would, is what I'm considering getting the, you know, certified or the construction industry financial professional certification. You know, I'm involved in various organizations in town where, you know, they push it, you know, the Builders Association of Northern Nevada and you know, things like that. I actually I just got accepted into a master's of taxation program for this fall. So one thing at a time. So I'll definitely do that first and then I'll probably turn for the CIFP designation. You just bring up a very interesting point. So you are a partner now. You have a CPA license and now you're going to get a master in tax. What makes you want to go to get a master degree when you already a partner in tax and then you already have a CPA license and you have so many years of experience already? That, that's a great question. It's a, it's a question I ask myself sometimes and I look at the class schedule and I realize I'm giving up my Tuesday nights and Saturday mornings for the year and a half, you know, starting in October. For me, it was really easy is I, I want to keep getting better at my job and, you know, with with all of the work I'm doing, you know, sure when, you know, a new tax bill comes out, the CARES Act or, you know, the Tax Cuts and Job Act in 2017, you know, it gives you the opportunity to kind of research and learn. But otherwise, the continuing education required for certified public accountants will give you enough you need to stay up on things, but you're not, you're not really going to drastically improve or get way better at your job just by doing that. 
And so you know, looking at what I do, I think that the biggest hole or potential hole in my knowledge and my ability to serve my clients is you know, all of the tax code I haven't been exposed to. You know, the things that are specifically applicable for contractors, you know, of the size that I work with, I'm sure I know most of those, but it's, as other things come up, I don't want, I would hate to do a disservice for my clients because I didn't know something or wasn't aware of something. And so I did a lot of research to find a master's of taxation program that wasn't a CPA exam prep course, because I think a lot of the master's of accountancy programs can lead that way. And so uh, I actually found Cal State University Northridge, they require you to have three years of professional experience or to already have your CPA license to get into the program. And so they're really just targeting making practicing professionals better as opposed to you know goals to pass a test that you've already passed. And so I'm doing it so I can keep getting better. I think it's the easiest thing I can do as far as you know not having to you know look up 50 different CPEs or lectures on my own. I sign up for one program and over a year and a half, I think it's gonna make me a lot better at my job for my clients, you know, make me more valuable for them. Also, I think it doesn't hurt that when people are looking for a tax professional, there's, you know, CPA license is big, but there's a lot of people with the CPA license. And uh, at the end of the day, if the client was good enough at tax to be able to tell who's good at tax and who's not by talking to them, they wouldn't need a tax guy. And so just having something else to kind of differentiate myself from someone else and show that I am so committed and focused on the tax side, uh, I think being able to put MST, you know, behind the CPA and my email signature will help with that a little bit too. So since you already did a lot of research about the MST or MSA or MBA, I was wondering if you can give some ideas if you already have a CPA license, which degree would be the best for you? I think that answer has to be, you know, especially if you're going back after you have your CPA license, it has to be on an individual by individual basis. You know, for example, if you're not doing hardly any tax, don't go get an MST. You know, that, that would be the worst thing you could do. You know, I don't want a master of science in accounting because I do very little gap work, right? So getting better in my you know, gap skills uh, isn't gonna help me in my career or help my clients. Uh, I think the MBA is really attractive and I think more accountants should do it, uh, especially if you don't have any experience in industry. You know, if you haven't actually worked in a business environment and you've only worked in public accounting, I think an MBA would give you a lot of exposure to help make you that more valuable advisor for your clients. Or if you're solely in, you know, CAS or advisory, then um, then the MBA is a good option. I, I feel like I have enough exposure. You know, why I ruled that out for myself was because I'd worked for, you know, four or five years on the operational side, you know, in a business that's not public accounting. And so, so that's why I didn't go that route. But I, I think that we'll see more and more accountants pursue the MBA. It helps make you different. At the end of the day, you being better at really specific gap stuff that doesn't apply to that client isn't going to help that client nearly as much as you understanding, you know, general business environment and concepts better. It's funny, we actually have an intern now who got his undergraduate degree in accounting, is working on his, getting his license, but he's also enrolled in the uh, MBA program at UNR. Yeah, I, I think that that's a trend we'll see more in public accounting for sure. So if you have CPA license and you have MBA uh, degree already, would you recommend that person to get MST when that person specifically focused in tax? Um, potentially, I, you know, it really comes down to that person's tax knowledge, but I'm starting the program in October. My answer may change then, but I, I think it's really worth considering for most people just because, you know, the tax, there's so much tax law and there's so much case law regarding the tax law. It doesn't even matter how well you know it and can interpret it. It matters how well you know how every Ninth Circuit ruling has ever interpreted it. And, you know, there's so many applications and, you know, kind of opportunities to apply it and apply it to client circumstances that I, from what I understand and what I'm hoping to get out of this Master's of Science and Taxation program, I, I, I really think that anyone who's focused on the tax should consider it. Now you're not just always working on a full-time job, you're a partner at the firm and you go back to school. How can you handle when you're doing both job at the same time. I think it could be challenging. I'm also very fortunate that our firm just doesn't have the same culture as a lot of public accounting firms. I might work 2,300 hours this year. I might not. And if I do, I'll work 250 hours more than anyone else. You know, it's just we we have high enough billing rates that we feel like the firm can make plenty of money with people working full time. You know, we're not requiring people to put in 70 hour weeks, 80 hour weeks in tax season. You know, I work about 55 hours a week in tax season. That being said, I did find a program that because it focuses on practicing professionals, they um, they stop all classes from February 15th through April 15th. 
So there's no school requirements then because they know that they're, they've geared their, por- their program for practicing professionals. And so they're not going to put that burden on them in busy season. You know, also the program, it's three and a half hours on Tuesday nights and it's three and a half hours on Saturday mornings. So, you know, it might be a little less time to golf. <laughs> You know, I might not be able to walk my dogs on Tuesday night, but my uh, I mean, my wife, who's also a CPA, is very supportive. And, um, you know, we've kind of talked through that you know, the things that I can't do on those nights, she's happy to take care of. And I think the, what will suffer most is my golf time on Saturday mornings, but uh, I spend too much time on the course anyways, so that's all right. I think your wife did come over at the Leadership Academy, right? Yep. Oh yeah. Yes, she did. Yeah. She, she. I've got family in North Carolina, so she flew out for the for the reception at the end, and then we yeah. spent the time with family. She'll be at Engage also, so I'm sure you'll see her then. Um, nice. Yeah, Can I wait to see you both again? Go back to the topic about after you graduate, you uh, start working in public. Did you try to study for CPA exam right after you graduate? Uh, or you work for a little bit and then you you take CPA exam? Yeah, I didn't do it right away. And I I don't think I did it in the most efficient way. You know, I definitely would recommend to people that they try to jump into it right away just because, you know, you're, when your brain is wired to study is the best time to kind of do the studying and the tests. It, you know, it's just the working is a different environment. Nevada has a little bit stricter rules. Um, you actually have to have 4,000 hours of experience in public to get your license. And so that's two years full time. And so, you know, when I finished school, I was like, oh, I'll wait till, you know, about the end of my two years and I'll start taking my tests. And then my two years passed and then my three years passed. And then I was almost getting on four and I was like, I probably need to go do this now. And it, you know, the, the motivation to get it, it kind of hurt because you realize that whether you have the license or not, you're kind of doing the same job. You know, your, your ability to prepare tax returns, to tie out a trial balance, to, you know, generate work papers, Getting the license doesn't impact that at all. It just impacts your ability to advance. And, you know, I knew a lot of people who had their license who weren't very good at their job. And so I was like, ah, oh, you know, it made it hard to work hard for this thing. Our firm actually, to counteract the hours of tax season, we work reduced hours between October 15th and the end of the year. You know, we only have to work uh, 32 hours a week during that time. And so, you know, on weeks with holidays where, you know, Thanksgiving, for example, we get Thursday, Friday off. Well, then you get your extra day off, so you know, it's a two-day work week. And so I was like, oh, I decided I'd start studying for my exams after October 15th. Um, actually, in 2021, I just got my license. Got a full head of steam, and I took all four tests in six weeks, and I passed each on my first try. I wouldn't recommend doing that to anyone else because I was almost not a human being during that time. It was, you know, eat, sleep, and study for the CPA exams. But I got through all four in the six weeks of our shortened window and you know, shortened work window, and that was that. But I wouldn't recommend waiting that long to anyone else. Wow, that's very, very impressive such a short period of time and then you pass them all in just one try wow i was lucky and i'd also give some credit to becker you know their their practice exams are very accurate and so i you know instead of working my way through the modules i'd take a practice exam identify okay here's you know if there's 16 modules there was anywhere from 7 to 11 that i was going to be fine on and so then i would just go back and study those modules that i'd done poorly on in the practice exam take another practice exam, you know, maybe there's two or three more I needed to go pay some more attention to and then take their final prep exam. And I did that over two weeks for each test. I went two weeks test, two weeks test, two weeks test, two weeks test, and I was done. Well, do you think that because you already have some experience on your hands before you take the exam, so it could be very helpful for you as well? I think it helped a lot with BEC and with tax or and with reg because those are kind of the things I work in. I think that had I worked in audit, audit or FAR would have been easier. I, I definitely think that because I waited so long between college and now and that we don't do much audit, we don't do hardly any gap, work and even our reviews are mainly tax basis that definitely hurt me on the audit and gap side there was or the audit and far side just because there were you know plenty of things i hadn't been exposed to in years but definitely my work experience helped me with reg and with bec so i actually took reg first because i just figured i work in tax this is going to be the easiest test for me let me try to start something with momentum i took reg and then i took audit because i knew i wanted to put far after thanksgiving weekend since i'd have five days i could designate to just diving in and you know you know eat sleeping and breathing far so i definitely found it's funny i thought that was the hardest test it's the test i felt the least confident about it was the test i scored highest on which doesn't make any sense but uh and then i took bec last because it just felt like if you pass the first three you can't you know it's almost impossible to fail bec <laughs> You mentioned that um, the CPA license doesn't affect much in your career. 
But how about your promotion? Because I know that in California, a lot of firms, if you do not have CPA license, they cannot promote you to be managers. Some firms, exceptional, they do promote people without CPA license. But does that apply to your firm? So I could have made manager. I actually was a manager before I got my CPA license. Um, the most difficult parts about it were on business development, as far as getting beyond manager. You know, if I wanted to bring in clients, you know, and the client asks you, "Oh, are you a CPA?" You can't say yes if you're not. You know, they don't ask, "Are you a tax accountant?" Even though that's what they mean. You know, they ask, "You know, are you a CPA?" And so, so there's that, and you know, the ability to you know sign returns and interact with the IRS and do those things. And so, firm ownership had kind of laid out a plan for me, and they're like, "Well, you know, you have to get your billings to a certain number." And you have to be licensed, you know, to be uh, in the state of Nevada. Uh, you have to be licensed to own a public accounting firm. So for me, it wasn't the promotion to manager, but it was the ability to partner that really, you know, necessitated me to go get the license. Yeah, talking about you being a panel, I know that it took it took you only five years, right? Correct. It's, it's very very fast for five years. And so I would like to dip more in your career about from the time when you start as a staff. To become a partner as you are today, what were your top challenges when you start as a staff level in a, at a small CPA firm after you graduate? Some of the most challenging things for me were um, not necessarily the hard skills of accounting, but all of the things that go around it. You know, organization. I am not a particularly organized person by nature, and you know, and it, I could trace it all the way back to you know turning in my homework in second grade, right, where the teacher would say, "Oh, but you didn't show your work." Well, you think that doesn't matter, right? Because you got to the right answer. And tell a manager is trying to review a work paper. Doesn't matter if the answer is right. If they can't trace why it's right, the work paper is worthless. And so organization, both in you know, kind of how I put things together and how I presented my you know my work and my ideas on work papers was a really big challenge for me. And then the wasn't so much right away, but my once I went from staff to senior and then started to go from senior to manager. The biggest challenge for me is that you know and this came up at Leadership Academy plenty was that my only you know leadership experience and exposure really had been. On athletic teams in you know high school and a little bit in college, and so it's just the feedback I got from the you know founding partner was uh, leadership in accounting firm is very different than leadership on a sports field. You know on a sports field, tough love is great. You know if someone does bad, you can tell them they did bad, and you need them to do better. Most staff accountants don't go into accounting for someone to tell them they did bad and they can do better. That was a really big roadblock. I kind of ha- I. I had to overcome, and I'm still working on overcoming how to motivate people in a way that is, uh, you know, that in no way is, you know, has kind of that conflict element or or an element that would make them feel down because it, it's a really hard job your first couple of years. You know, you just you don't know what you're doing. You would think that in public accounting we would come up with a better way of teaching people than assigning a bunch of stuff that you don't know how to do and hoping you remember 20% more than last time, but we haven't. And so you don't need a manager on top of you, you know, making it seem harder than it is. And so, kind of how to lead in an encouraging way, but still, um, still not giving people a false sense of confidence, has been has been one of my bigger challenges. Mm-hmm.